Welcome to PL Together Lounge Talk. I'm Adam Geller, founder and CEO of Edthena, the video observation platform for streamlining feedback to teachers. Today, we're talking with Nina Gilbert. She's a former classroom teacher, former school design, school launcher, I guess I'll say she launched a network of schools. And now she's the director of the Center for Excellence in Education at Morehouse College. Nina, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Adam. So I want to kind of dive in here about one of the topics that's on folks' mind. I, I, I think of it as on the front burner instead of the back burner, which is, you know, kind of the topics of race and equity, uh, which are always important as educators, but how those are interconnected with what we're seeing in the news. So I guess, you know, let's remind ourselves, you know, how have things shifted for educators compared to a year ago uh, when it comes to topics of race and equity? And I guess maybe the choice of whether or not we're even going to be talking about this within our classrooms. Hmm. So I don't know if it's shifted uh, as much as it's been uh, magnified. I think topics that were once considered to be taboo um, are talked about so frequently and freely uh, on the news, on even comedy skits if anyone watches uh, Saturday Night Live or some other late night talk shows, you know, race and politics are now, you know, just material for comics, right? And so there's no escaping it. It's, you know, front and center and, you know, most social media uh, posts. So of course, to come into the school or the classroom and think that that's not top of mind for students and teachers is, you know, we would be fooling ourselves if we think that that was the case. So I, I don't think it's shifted. I do think it's, it's not even the elephant in the room. It's a herd of elephants um, in a very small room. I like the, the, the redirect you did there on my word shifted. You said magnified because I think uh, you shifted allows for some interpretation for somebody coming into it to uh, convince themselves that it wasn't important before and now it's important. And I think magnified says it, it was important and we turned up the volume on how much we're, you know, how much we're paying attention to it. Yeah. Uh, so as, as teachers are, are thinking about how that's going to play out in their classrooms, as school leaders are thinking about how they want to kind of shape what that learning looks like. I mean, uh, you know, one, one thing that I, people might be thinking about is I need to talk about race from the lens of what we're seeing in the news. Um, and certainly that's one angle, but I'm curious, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, are there other ways that we could be engaging students on issues of race and equity that, um, you know, maybe are, are, are more generative for them or feel more productive for them or feel more within their locus of control? Yeah. Um, this is hard, right? It's really hard because if we go back to you know the the terminology around shifting versus magnifying, the shift feels like okay. I guess we'll talk about race now, um, and I do think that that's how some people feel. And there's this performance that and this dance that I see often, where not just schools but organizations, ed reform organizations are notorious for this, um, putting out, you know, this statement about all lives mattering and we stand by behind um, law enforcement, but we also stand behind our sisters and brothers of color. Like, that's a statement. How do you operationalize your commitment? And I think unless we are committed to listening, like truly listening to people, whether they are white police officers or African-American males who feel targeted or mothers of color who are terrified every time their male son leaves 
home or school or work or their husbands or brothers. And until we have um, this, a commitment to listening to all sides, I hate even using that terminology, but listening to all sides, all perspectives, all lived experiences, um, we're not going to make any progress uh, or the type of progress that we need because schools will still be very polarizing places because adults who lead the schools and who teach in the schools, we are, we've, not had, we've not been able to model what that conversation should look like and we've not had it modeled for us. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I love storytelling. I love giving students an opportunity to use journals, um, to use art, um, use various ways to express themselves, their fears. I do think uh, trauma-informed teaching strategies and practices are important and not just around these racial issues, but even for students who have experienced other types of trauma uh, during COVID, previous you know, to COVID, you know, who have been assaulted or, or abused in some way or lost a parent. If we don't give students an outlet, you know, a way to express some of what they're feeling or experiencing, it just bubbles up and explodes, right? And that's when we see increased uh, disciplinary problems. We see students who disengage from the learning process, um, teachers who have a very low tolerance and don't know how to uh, support a student who may have all of these issues uh, that are related to trauma or related to living in, um, I guess, the shadows of systemic and pervasive racism and poverty. Like, what does that look like? How does that show up? Um, and then the divisive rhetoric we hear from our local, state, and national leaders, regardless of their party, right? We, schools are a great place to start the healing. Um, but without a curriculum, without a mandate, it's not going to happen, right? We just continue with our standards-based instruction and testing uh, when students are not even socially, emotionally able to engage in learning because there's so many other unmet needs that are non-academic. I'm, I'm uh reflecting on what, what you just shared. And I, I think there are two, two important buckets. I mean, one was the kind of really important uh, support structures, making those available for students to process and deal with uh, trauma and hurt and pain. Um, absolutely important. I, I think the other thing which struck me and that I, you know, you pointed out was, um, the the feeling that some educators might have that uh, you know it's the performative conversation about race or the performative lesson, right? And so that feels like maybe a response to what's happening right now. And I'm wondering if maybe you know is there an opportunity for us to do some work to kind of redirect that energy and attention into the broader conversation of social justice? I mean, how can social justice be part? of what we're teaching. So it's not, uh, you know, the kind of lightning rod style conversations that could result in classrooms, which could be delicate or challenging to navigate without training. Um, how can we redirect our energy as educators to focus on this question of social justice and motivate our students to, to learn about that and, and, you know, making the world a better place, so to say. Sure. And so I think it's around like defining what that means, right? <clears throat> and, and making sure the definition is really clear for all parties, right? And so take social out of it. Like, what does justice mean, right? So justice could mean that if I live in a particular town in Michigan and my water is brown, but I lived, lived 10 miles away in another town in Michigan, and my water looks like it came from a place called Crystal Springs, right? It's, it's, that's, is, that's an issue of justice. Um, 
or some communities have cell towers, you know, and they cause cancer supposedly, and in other communities they don't. Or like if we take this social justice framework and approach and apply it to even like environmental justice. Like I think we all know that we all benefit from a cleaner planet. We all benefit when we pay attention to climate change. Um, we all benefit when we have healthy food. So if we can help students regardless of their race, their political um, preference, um, or those of their families see in what ways are we all the beneficiaries when things are better and what would make that better? It kind of, I think, uh, take some of the vitriol out of the conversation around race because I don't think that people see the conversation around race as being one that heals. It's one that points fingers that some people are, have been enabled, other people have privilege, other people um, consider themselves allies to people who can't defend themselves. And so it, unless there is some training and I don't know who is properly equipped to do that training, I will say as a woman of color, I have experienced um, being in rooms where we're talking about race, diversity and inclusion and equity and my voice has been muted. Like, not that I muted it myself, but the other people in the room who did not look like me, but considered themselves as experts on race, muted my voice. Um, so it's really hard for people of color sometimes to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives because we're not consulted. But if we can talk about social justice in a broader, more a broader way, where we talk about making this planet a better place for all of us to live, I think that's a great place to start, especially when you're talking about young learners. Uh, and as we develop conversations around more complex issues around equity and equality, which I think are two different things, equity, equality, race, politics, like I think that requires a different level of discourse and preparation. I was worried that I may have created an like a, you know, especially, I, you know, as an interviewer here, but I'm a white male, like I wanted to make sure that I I didn't create like a, a, an opportunity for someone to misdirect or, or not tackle race by saying it was okay to talk about social justice and said, you know, they're related, but not the same things. And, um, and I'm still worried about that a little bit uh, for someone that's watching this, but what I think feels really strong to me and what you just shared was that that kind of idea of, um, orienting around something that can be more uniting as a, as a pathway to all these other topics, right? It, it hasn't taken away from the importance of dealing with any of those really challenging conversations we do need to continue to have at all different age levels. But rather than feeling dug in, and like you said, pointing fingers, it allows us at least to start taking steps in a direction. It's not even about the right direction, it's in a direction that right. we are agreeing upon, we should be heading to somewhere together. And, and so, so maybe that's why talking about social justice in the classroom can be, um, again, not a substitute, but a, uh, an opportunity for educators to feel like they can wrap their hands around that with their students and with their com in the context of their community without also needing to simultaneously, like you said before, uh, talk about all the elephants in the room that are, are definitely there. And it's not gonna get accomplished in a nine week grading period, right? We're talking about over 400 years of just, yes. So, and there's so many different perspectives, right? There's some historically inaccurate teaching that has to be undone and unlearned that, that that's another whole thing right so 
when I think about culturally responsive teaching and making sure that we are being uh, responsive to all of the students in the and in, in that we're responsible for, um, understanding what it means when you're talking to a student who's indigenous heritage, right? And we're talking about it's Thanksgiving time and we're going to talk about Christopher Columbus and the Indians. That's how, that's what I learned in school growing up. Like we made turkeys with our hands and feathers and put it in our hats. And we talked about Thanksgiving in a way that, you know, made sense to us and aligned with my third grade and fourth grade textbook. Um, but knowing that we now have a multicultural, um, multiracial, multi-ethnic student population, especially where I live, those stories don't align with the stories and the, the truths of those students who may, um, you know, come from an indigenous or native background. And until we are ready to grapple with that and understand that, while it's, it's why it's not okay to suspend the student who says, my daddy told me Christopher Columbus didn't discover America. And that student not be suspended for gross disrespect. I've seen that happen. Um, like that's what culturally responsive teaching is, like being responsive to all of the, cult the cultures and backgrounds of everyone that you're responsible for. Well, Nina, we are about out of time. So I, I wanna keep talking about this topic, but uh, we're about out of time. So I wanna make sure we save a minute here for asking you our extra credit question before we wrap up. And that question is, what's something that's changed for you uh, personally or professionally that you hope will continue even when life goes back to normal, pre-pandemic normal, whatever that is, uh, you know, what's something positive that's happened that you hope will sustain? I would say looking for multiple ways to um, engage with students. Um, I find myself checking in with students via text now. Um, I Zoom, I call, I send emails. Um, I've uh, arrange to meet students for lunch, you know, we social, you know, we're socially distant and all of that, but looking for ways to stay engaged uh, because there was so much we took for granted prior to this. And so I'm always thinking about how to make learning experiences better, um, more rewarding and more enriching um, for, for students. And I, I think that while COVID has been horrific, it has also required us to innovate and think differently um, about how we continue to make um, learning stick for our students and um, kind of deepen our relationships with the folks we care the most about. Great to hear, awesome to hear about the, uh... You know, you're bring, you're able to bring more of yourself to the teaching. It sounds like, and and kind of all the different ways to support students. Well, Nina Gilbert, it's been great talking with you. Thanks for being part of our uh, conversations. If you're just joining us and wondering what we talked about before this, uh, or who else I've talked to as part of PL Together, head to pltogether.org for the rest of this conversation as well as many more. Nina Gilbert. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure.